Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well. Plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. Acton, Acton, welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, James Holland, from Normandy. I'm a roving reporter, effectively, and I'm with Joey, our producer, and we are at Lafayette, which is sort of hallowed turf, um, hallowed ground if you're part of the 82nd Airborne. This is where they had a very big action on D-Day and on into uh, D plus one, actually, and beyond... It's quite a busy road now because we're in D-Day 80 week and it's just absolutely non-stop. This is only Monday. So here we are on Monday, the 3rd of June. And I'm just walking up the hill to Gavin's Foxhole. Now, it's always right, what makes me laugh whenever I come here because it's, it's sort of a uh, side of the road and it's got four little posts and little white chains around it. And it's the most feeble looking scrape in the ground. But apparently this is where the great man hunkered down and sort of kept his head low uh, on D-Day and beyond. In actual fact, Gavin came down on the other side of the murder. We're looking at the River Murder. I'm kind of looking back down the hill towards Crickville and, uh, and the bridge where a Swedish immigrant into the US who joined the 82nd Airborne managed to shoot out some 1940s era French tanks purloined by the Germans as they counterattacked across this Codder Causeway because... All the area around the murder as I think Alan and I mentioned in our D-Day series, was flooded. But Gavin, he came down on the far side, on the western side of the River Murder A, and managed to build up a whole load of people, and they waded across the kind of flooded area. And uh, by the time he got here, it's a kind of sort of ridge line at Lafayette. The Lafayette is the name of the, of the little sort of farmhouse, a little manoir. Uh, and by the time they got up here, there was about 150 of them, something like that. And he knew that he had to defend this highland because what you've got is you've got Utah Beach on the eastern coast and then it's flooded behind there. There's some causeways and that rises up to a ridge. Not a huge, hugely high ridge, but a significant ridge all the same. And that bit of high ground, that sort of high plateau lasts for, I would say, probably about 10 miles. And San Meraglise, the famous San Meraglise, is at kind of the heart of that. And it's a crossroads, but it's also through which the main road between Cherbourg and the main part of Normandy runs, and also the railway line. And obviously, you always want the high ground, but you also want to hold those key lines of communication. So the 82nd Airborne are scattered all over the place, and, and the reason they're particularly scattered is because of this flooding. I think it's the 507th who land down in the, who get the worst of it. Um, the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment, who get the worst of it in this kind of flooded area. And although it's not terribly deep, you know, if you're kind of weighed down by really heavy stuff, that's a problem. Anyway, Gavin's here, and here is his foxhole. Um, and obviously, you know, the years have not been kind to this, I think it's fair to say. But ici combatit le général James M. Gavin, le 6 juin 1944, in my best French accent. Well, what I can see is I can see the four white posts, little chains around it, and what is the remains of a hollow? I mean, it is unquestionably um, a foxhole there, but it's not a huge impression on the ground, a huge dent in the ground. Uh, and it comes at the side of this road, and I don't know how many people go there because, you know, it is the side of a road, and you don't, you don't want to get run over, etc., in your quest to follow in the footsteps of the great man. But um, it's extraordinary. We've, all, we've, we've driven from Caen this morning... And um, the Jeeps are out in force and the Jimmies and the command cars and the Dodge WC-51s. Seen lots of them. We've seen a Camp Geronimo in San Marigles stuffed full of Sherman tanks. Every other person you bump into is wearing 101st Airborne kit or tankers jackets and um, looking a little bit older and perhaps a little bit more portly than might have been the case had they really been soldiers from 1944. But that's okay. I mean, everyone's having a good time. And it's always an extraordinary week because it is a kind of, you know, it is a, it's a circus to a certain extent. But it's great that people are so interested still and want to come here and want to feel a part of it, and want to breathe the same air and see the land. And, 
you know, it's all part of the commemoration, isn't it? And remembering what people did on those days. But we're walking down now, back down towards the bridge where our Swedish soldier in the 82nd Airborne knocked out the German tanks on the afternoon of the 6th of June. Because just in what was the flooded area around the murder a, some of the Band of Brothers actors are going to be jumping out of Dakotas. And we're expecting them to come over any minute now. It's uh, just coming up to half past eight, and that's when they're due over. And it'll be quite a thing. I've just been to Tim, who's the, the uh, chairman of the MVT, the Military Vehicle Trust. And Tim had delivered them up to Cherbourg, to the airport, and saying they're all a little bit nervous. And I was thinking, well, I'm not surprised. I mean, yeah, it's quite a thing jumping out of an aircraft, particularly of a 1944-era round parachute. Now crossing the bridge, there is a river murder. I mean, it's a tiny stream, really, but uh, it's a big thing. And we've got, we're looking at this absolutely gorgeous countryside. This is much more sort of bocage than where we were this morning around um, to the east of Caen. And you can see how low-lying it is. And you can see how this would have been flooded. And how disorientating it is, I think, if you're... It's all very well having maps and stuff, but if you don't know where you are on the map, then the map is completely useless, and that's always a problem. And, and what's interesting is just how accurate the, the airborne drops are, really, in the big scheme of things. They've got a kind of reputation for being scattered all over the place. In actual fact, they were pretty good. But the problem is, is you've got lots of people landing willy-nilly and all over the place, out of their sequence, out of their platoons, and not knowing exactly where they are and so it's incredibly disorientating in the dark at night with enemy troops around trace all over the place and the problem here also i think and this is the really key point this is sort of different for the americans from the british where the british are coming down and sort of let's say in the ronville area and drop z n it's really really obvious where they're landing you know, there's really key features. There's water towers on the Breville Ridge that you can orientate yourself. There's a, there's a tower at Colombelle. There's a big flat open open area. So it's much easier for them to sort of go, OK, I, I, I see where we are now and, and orientate yourself and get to where you need to be. Here, it's just field after field, tree after tree, hedge after hedge. And it's really, really difficult to work out where you are. And this is why... At 6.30 a.m. on the morning of D-Day, you know, each of the divisions is barely a thousand strong in terms of men organised and knowing where they ought to be. And so necessarily, they've just got to kind of, they've got to kind of work out what they're doing on the hoof. And, and that's what happens here at Lafayette. But because they're well trained, because they are highly motivated to do what they're doing, they're able to organise themselves and organise themselves really well and make that, that crucial defence. And they don't give up the ground here. Uh, so this is tremendously exciting. I can see a Dakota. It's just circling in. It's it's not very high, possibly. Oh, what's that? It's probably only about a thousand foot. I'd say something like that, eight hundred feet, something like that, coming directly towards us. You can just faintly hear the hum of the engine coming over. You can just imagine how nervous these guys must be feeling right now as they prepare to come out. But I think they've done quite a lot of training. This, so these are, um, it's a handful of actors from Band of Brothers. You know, we're not talking about the main stars, but we're talking about bit parts, players. But for a lot of these guys, that whole experience has just stayed with them. It's really, it was an emotional time and, and I felt they felt very connected and a huge great responsibility to, to what they, to the roles they had, the part they're playing and keeping that torch alive. And, these uh, markers have just been released. So this is uh, to position them on the drop zone. It's fluttering down. There's two long yellow strips uh, are fluttering down through the sky. These are the markers for the drop zone. And, you know, what do I know? But it looks like a pretty accurate drop to me. The Dakota is now circling. I'm about to be blinded looking into the sun. But it's an amazing sight. I was lucky enough once to uh, fly over Normandy in a, in a C-47, a Dakota. Uh, and actually, it, it had been used on D-Day and had dropped members of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, which included, of course, Easy Company of the 101st Airborne of the 506th of Band of Brothers fame. And um, it's a hell of a thing. You know, it, they're pretty spare inside. They're pretty... Not much uh, concessions to comfort. But, you know, when you're flying in one of these, you're very mindful of the history behind them and what they represent. 
It's now circling around again. So the Dakota had disappeared off in, into the distance, circled round. It's now coming back in, and I'm assuming this is for its for its drop. But obviously, it's such a different kettle of fish. You know, we've got a beautiful day today. There's hardly a breath of wind. Lots of lovely blue sky. It's gorgeous early June summer's day. You know, so very different from the high winds and the bank of cloud that so many of the Dakotas ran into as they crossed over the west coast of the Kotan, southern base of the Kotantan Peninsula. And this was the two things they hadn't been expecting was the, the cloud, the wind, and the sudden huge amounts of tracer coming towards them. And, you know, they were flying in kind of sort of huge VIX formations, so sort of V-shaped, like a, you know, imagine um, a load of duck or geese flying over. That's sort of what they were looking like, that kind of formation. And... Um, in the cloud, suddenly you can't see, and they're all quite close together. So some are climbing, some are dropping. In actual fact, of the kind of 900 and something that came over, only 23 were shot down. I say only. I mean, that's obviously a significant amount. But but really, in the big scheme of things, that's not very many. And there was this feeling at the time that the crews were under-trained. You know, the pilots were the kind of, you know, the dropouts, really. You know, because if you're any good, you'd be a fighter pilot or bomber pilot weren't enough navigators you know nine troop carrier command had to double in size you know in just a matter of a couple of months but now it's flying straight over us you can see the invasion stripes on the wings it's just the most beautiful silhouette really against the sky it's coming out i guess it's about a thousand foot up something like that flying over again no parachutes yet no the first one's out coming down oh gosh i hope he doesn't land in there they'll come three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven eleven they're floating down big round green parachutes silk parachutes oh gosh i hope they don't fall in the river <laughs> second one coming down the first one coming down looks like he actually might just fall straight in it no i think they're going to be okay they're all right they've all you know all the shoots have opened that's the main thing so worst case scenario someone might um get a kind of twisted ankle or hurt a knee or whatever but they're all coming down it's the most beautiful sight it really is these little sort of teardrops dropping down you can hear them all calling out to one another someone's about to hit oh Look like one was about to go into the other. Oh my goodness! See, he's quite hairy, even on a kind of beautiful day like this. But what a what an incredible sight! Um, I've just got to take a picture actually, while I get the opportunity. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, they all seem to be okay. They've done it. What last one coming down over there? No one's falling in the river. I can see men getting up already. Yeah, everyone's cheering. It's just fantastic. What a thing to have done. I, I imagine it must have been a very emotional experience for all these guys. And we're going to hope, hopefully talk to um, Alex uh, Sabga Brady, who was the kind of man behind it all. One of the, uh, I think he played Frank Millett in the, in the Band of Brothers in two episodes and as an extra. But he's the guy, the brainchild behind all this. And um, I know they've been training at, in the United States and yeah an amazing thing to witness so we're, st we're still at Lafayette um we're in Helen Patton's joint um Helen has just been singing the theme tune to Band of Brothers as yet another stick of um paratroopers drops from the sky it's clear that she's um Every bit as, <laughs> as eccentric as her grandfather, but utterly delightful and charming. Um, so it's been great, great chatting to her. We'll, we'll catch up with her in a minute. But um, I'm here with Stu Bertie, my compadre from, um, from D-Day, Ohio, and obviously massive friend of the show, uh, ace photographer, all-round good egg. Um, Stu, you've been involved in this, this project right from the word go, pretty much, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. So I was chatting with Alex, who's, um, who's one of the Band of Brother actors. He had, he had a pretty small role, but he's sort of the driving force behind the whole 
Currahy to Normandy. Yeah, that's right. He just basically phoned some of the guys up saying, can we do can we do something with charity? Can we get our jump wings? Um, we need five jumps. Oh, and by the way, we're going to train in Tokoa. Uh, do you, do you, <laughs> you want to come and take some photos? And I'm like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Twist my arm. Yeah. How was it been going to Tokoa? I mean... Uh, I've just been saying it's hallowed ground walking up to Jim Gavin's Foxhole, but of course, you know, here we are in Lafayette in Normandy, but 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 Tacoa, that's you know, for the hundred and first airborne that's that's what's well, a pretty special place. Yeah, it is. Well, well camp a part of Camp Tacoa is still there. There's one original building and then they've assembled uh, three other barracks buildings from original materials and windows and panels and things like that. Uh, and that was our accommodation for the week. So, you know, 30 guys in a barracks was uh, was definitely an experience. And then surrounded by a load of ex-paratroopers and current paratroopers barking orders and things like that was was a bit of an experience and a revelation. <laughs> how, how do you think you'd sort of deal with military life? Is it, is uh, it for you? Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like a fish to water. I was like, I just need more of this. I mean, when I got home, I said to Melanie, my wife, I, said, I think we're just going to get the whole street. Self-employed, middle-aged uh, yeah. architect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to get the whole street together and get them to live in, our, in one of our bedrooms for a week because that, that's what I'm used to now. <laughs> and were you eating kind of sort of, you know, um, rub- we, rubbish army rations? We or, were or? eating MREs, meals ready to eat. And they come in a really attractive uh, sort Some of, no, 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 it's like a baby sick brown packaging. Uh, but having said that, it's not terrible. They have okay. like a little water heater yeah. uh, with magnesium. You put the food in and boils it. Amazing. So I wouldn't want to live on it forever, but it But you got, it, you to, you got to go in a Dakota, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So we all uh, assembled at uh, Tacoa Airport, a little, little airstrip with a concrete runway. Um, Placid Lassie came in. Uh, it takes the guys probably about an hour to kind of kit up. Uh, Is it really that yeah, long? Yeah, because it takes it, it. It's normally two people. You have a buddy, and then you all check each other as before you get on. And then when you're on the plane, you again check each other before you jump. Uh, so for one of the flights, I was at the front. I was sitting next to a chap called Ed Freeman. He was a 102 year old P47 pilot. No. Uh, and when we uh, when we were taking off, he was basically commenting on the piloting skills. <laughs> Uh, taking dim view or was he no 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 he said no he said something like oh yeah when we landed they came in a little faster than i expected (laughs) you know and this guy's like 100 102 but yeah i was i was stood at front i had the camera and they were all lined up so the door was at the back on the right um jump i was on mark lawrence was first out he played dukeman in band of brothers and just before he jumped he took a little look to his right and i've got a really nice shot of him doing that before before he falls out and then they go out within probably they're all out within 20 seconds yep and there's a guy at the end just to make sure they push you out in case there's any refusals. Uh, so, yeah, quite quite an experience. And then for the second jump, I was right underneath them for the drop zone. So I got some shots and, you know, they're right above the head. And you had to be a little bit careful because you're scanning around, making sure they don't land on you. And they had to make sure they don't land on each other as well. Yeah, yeah. But it was quite windy. It was sort of quite a, quite a challenging jump. But um, everyone came down um, reasonably safety. And, and you could see really see the that kind of uh, elation in their eyes, that kind of relief. You know, there's some like, nice kind of moments where they're sort of fist pumping and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah I've done it. And, and and immediately afterwards, they all kind of get, get together because you get the feeling it's a really kind of, it's a real joint effort and they all kind of feed off each other's en- en- energy and, and they're quite emotional and it's yeah. all, all that kind yeah, of good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can understand that. But what a thing to be involved with. Oh, it's amazing. Well, they did the training there of like a, like a static sort of platform with a, with a door and then they practice their kind of hook up and and their jump and their landing positions and you know folding the knees and, and all, all of those kind things of and then all in the shadow of Kerahi Mountain. Amazing, amazing. Well, Stu, it's it's great to see you over here. I think we're in for quite a week. No, it's a pleasure to be here. There's loads going on and uh, it's if today I've only just got here and it's already crazy. So I expect <laughs> that to carry on. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll chat to a couple of the guys, including Alex who's organised it all, and see what it was like actually jumping out. Well, I'm, I'm now standing under, just a little way from Iron Mike at Lafayette. I'm with Alex Abgabrady. And Alex, you're, you're looking absolutely the part. You've got the, the full 1944 pattern jump kit on, and you've just jumped out. Yes, we've just jumped. We've just jumped into Normandy, which is uh, still trying to get my head around it, uh, take it all in, enjoy it, primarily. Um, yeah. Uh, it's been a long, long road yes. to get here. So, so obviously, you know, you played a, a part in Frank Mallet in, yep. in Band of Brothers. Yeah. And obviously that, 
that whole experience must have been sort of very profound one really i should think a lasting yeah. one yeah I'm, well it's it's brought me here today so definitely it's it's imprinted on my dna now right. um it meant a lot to me when we did it it was one of my first acting jobs it, yep. uh, it was my first acting job and so how old were you then 22 so yeah i was the same age as my character as frank amazing um and it obviously my grandfather served in the second world war he was here on d-day was so, he? Yeah, he, he was. With? He was the uh, Air Sea Rescue. So he was just off the wow. coast. And he was a hero of mine. Of course. So I've always grown up with World War II in my mind and in my heart. And I've, yeah. I've always, it's always been a fascination. And I've loved, I've loved reading and studying about it. And then obviously to, to watch something like Saving Private Ryan, which I was like, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if I could do yeah, something like that? Yes. And then to get into Band of Brothers was just unbelievable, which back then you know we knew we were doing something that was quite special but i think what really kind of started to to anchor us and my fellow brothers my fellow actors to to this place was coming out here and working with veterans foundations and charities yes nice and just being a part of these ceremonies and these commemorations really started to really hit home on how important it is to keep the legacy and the memory of these these men and women yeah. alive yeah. uh british american french canadian australia ev everyone who served and but sort of about five years ago looking up at the jumps we thought that'd be cool wouldn't it <laughs> what if yeah. what if we, we we could sort of string something and when like you say together? we i mean you, you mean you and your my fellow, cast mates yeah brothers. yeah my fellow brothers yeah so we're a really really tight bunch i mean obviously the, the americans are over in the states and we we keep in contact but the brits we're we're very very tight type bunch i mean one of the guys is a godfather to my daughter you know oh, this that's is this amazing, is so isn't it? What a yeah fantastic thing. it is lovely we help each other out we work each, with each other a lot yeah. um and uh we're just a really close bunch of guys and yeah we thought well it would be good to to honor it and see if we could jump for real um and we came up with the idea to to string this documentary together so yeah. that the jump kurahita normandy and it's today is the the culmination of that it's we've done it we've we've trained in back in sokoa run kurahi which is the mountain yes, um, where episode one episode one yeah uh where the airborne trained and uh learned to jump and, with and the i hear that uh, you know, everyone tells me it's tougher than it looks oh, it's really tough run it's three it's not three miles up or three miles down it's three miles up and down yes both ways so it's, it's it's draining but we did it the first day we got there we thought right on our own six in the morning we're going to do this and yeah, staying on a camp, Camp Tekoa, and what's left of it was, uh, again, unbelievable. To, to be on that ground where these guys trained 82 years ago was phenomenal. Um, and it, you, you just keep sort of revolving in these little mind, it's hard to say, you, you, think about, you keep thinking about your character, about what they were thinking and how, how they would have reacted. And I suppose pretty similar to what, you know, when we're doing the training, the same sort of feelings yeah obviously today was very different to what they did so you flew out of Cherbourg today we flew out of Cherbourg today uh, came in over the peninsula a few nerves nervous at the beginning of it and then really started to just become a a reality yeah. you know we're, we're really really going to do this and uh I think you know when those engines start up on a C47 it's quite something it's it's noisy and then you just you get to this point where you you're up stand up hook up you know you check equipment and all these things that we did in the show start to come become yeah. real okay and put them into motion so things it's a fatalism as well up there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay Whatever. yeah yeah it's, it's just i mean it's a risk what of you're course. doing but so um yeah we did we did unfortunately have a have a, a a slight accident with one of our cast members who's hurt his foot so yes, i'm sorry to hear that yeah so we, we're well, looking you know, at but, but but you know we can yeah kept saying yeah you know, th these things are even in, p in perfect conditions yeah you know when you're operating with round shoots they're um they're difficult it, it's, yeah. it's it's not without danger no you come down at the speed you come down and so mark lawrence is fantastic he's he's uh, being checked out at the moment and you know with suspected injury breaking foot so oh, no. yeah but well you know he was, he's the type of guy that if it's going to happen he'll motor through it and soldier on and yeah. he, he really is that guy um so all our love to to marky boy um, on but this. can you remember what you were thinking as you were floating down? I mean, well, thinking the the kind of the serenity of it, uh, but the opposite of what these guys went through. Yes, you know, 80 years ago it was hellfire. It was dark. It was a fire coming up from the ground, not knowing where they were going. Uh, trying to link up with fellow company members, and we had the complete opposite of that today. We had calm. We had sunshine. We had warmth. We had peace, 
and they had hell. Mm. So it really is, they were shining down saying, we're going to give you what we didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been up there as well. Yes, yes. How was it? It was great. It was great. And it, it was uh, it was surreal being up there because Ali and Mellet were in the same plane on the same stick together on the day. And then, you know, in our own very small way, we were back there together and it hit me on the plane. I was just really? like, wow, wow. So were you yeah. on the first jump? Yeah. You were number three, you said? I was number eight. Yeah, right, right behind Mark. Yeah, bless him. There you are, floating on this area, which, you know, where the 507th came down. I mean, I know they're 82nd Airborne rather than 101st, but, you know, paratroopers were coming down here on, on the night of early hours of D-Day on this very spot. You know, beautiful today, but would have been flooded back then. It's a hell of a thing to do. You know, it really is. It's amazing, just unbelievable. As Alex said, once I got out the plane, it's just so serene and quiet, and you're looking, thinking, wow, just don't land in the river. <laughs> well, we were thinking the same. Actually. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. We were like, oh, God, you know. I hope they don't don't go in. But listen, guys, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Well done for doing it. And, uh, and you're raising a bit of money as well, are you? So, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're raising money for this project. All the proceeds from what we're doing will go back to the charities. Uh, but we have funded this ourselves. And we are donating. You know, we need donations to keep this project going. Okay. So and where, and where, where can people donate? So, com. Curahy to normandy.com okay and we'll we'll put a note up about that as amazing well, so. wonderful well listen enjoy the rest of the uh, rest of the trip and are you doing a second jump on the eighth yes best of luck with that thank you mate thank you cheers